They can look it up. Whatever. <laughs> They've yeah. got to be handing everything to these people. Uh, what? Uh, <laughs> Ar- Arcade Fire, another French Canadian band. Another Montreal product. Mm-hmm. Uh, who else? I'm not talking Canadian specifically. French Canadian. French Canadian. Yeah. Oh, uh, Celine Dion, the most famous. Oh, there we go. There yeah. you go. Okay. She went right. down we with a giant ship in a movie with Leonardo DiCaprio. Well, she did. Her well, heart will she go did it on. In, yeah, in a music video. She. I don't think she like. She didn't die in the music video. No, she's still alive. She sang the songs, the beautiful songs that There's made the world. You know, she should do Barry Manilow covers. Um, <laughs> no, what? I, is, she, is she still running in Vegas or did she? I think she her, I think her contract. No, I think it's Britney now, right? It's Britney, bitch. I think that that, that was at the um, uh, the same casino. It's uh, okay, it was Celine and now it's Britney. Um, the- apparently, they are uh. I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts, the Ice Cream Social podcast that is based in Vegas, and they talk a lot about Vegas industry stuff. But apparently the the Palms, once the uh, one of the epicenters of cool young Vegas in the early aughts, late 90s. One of the real worlds. One of the real world suites. Yeah. Good place in the Palms. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that always had their CES party. They are now apparently gearing up to become a super hip destination again. Uh, I think they have a a card residency and uh, all these new like themed suites and some gigantic uh, video wall they just put in. But uh, allegedly, <laughs> it's now going to be a new cool place. Sounds like a slam dunk video wall. Yeah, well, uh, I, think, I, I think it's just no more. Place to, I'd rather stay. Sure, it sure. is a little off the strip, so I think it's a, <laughs> yeah. it's more a glittering lower. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it took took me a, a minute. I uh, apologize, but uh, Corey Hart. Men without hats. Oh, men without hats. Also, it's the one guy. Now. Men without hats is French Canadian. They're Quebecois. Yeah, Quebecois. Is it mm-hmm. Corey Hurt? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. Um. Yeah. Don't don't search for any. Uh, who else? I mean, uh, I, there are a I, lot of bands listed in this uh, article I'm looking at with French names, which makes sense. Which uh, makes for, sense for, for like people that you know, like the King. Isn't Avril Lavigne? Also, uh, from Canadian. Canadian. I don't think she's uh, from Montreal. I will. Which... I will say that I I've spent a few days in Montreal and I had an absolute blast. And I've known a few people from there that I very much liked. But if there's one group of people that I would feel comfortable coming out as prejudiced against, it is a uh, uh, Quebecois. Mostly because when you grow up in South Florida, uh, they uh, invade like a foreign army during the the winter months, and they can. Be a this little is, rude. This is actually a thing that I know. I feel, having I feel having like, also visited Florida I, I, at the same hold, time, hold, where I'm like, hold on, hold on, hold on, the hold Canadians on. coming. I, from? I must hasten to add here that when Ra- Justin says that, it is in full awareness that the Quebecois are a minority in Canada, and he doesn't mean it the way many of you may have thought he meant it. Uh, uh, I'll tell you what, take it how you want. Uh, uh, you know, I, I worked as a waiter for years Justin, down there. I'm trying uh, uh, to save you. You, 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 can, you can buy my the, the, thing again. the thing we call a tip. <laughs> it's just skin flints. It is not <laughs> super cool to say that. All right, that's fine. Look, I'm not here for your... I, I don't know what happens when you go back home. All I know is what happens when you're on vacation. You don't fit in that bathing suit, Pierre. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's not, know it's I'm not people about. from Quebec. It's Pierre who's wearing a bag. It, it looks. I know. I, I. I. I just knew it, when you get cut off in traffic, and and you just knew for a fact it was going to be that bl- that that white with blue trim license plate, just staring you right in the face, right in the eyeball. I mean, that's a. Very long distance to travel with a car. Well, because they stay for months. Oh, they stay yeah. for like three months. They stay yeah. for the maximum allowable before you have to leave. So yeah, I'm I'm uh, uh and uh, look, I'm playing this up uh, for 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 laughs here. Uh, my my right. grand uh, my grandparents uh, had uh, neighbors that were there for part of the year that were extremely nice. They were very very cool. Um, but man, everybody else. The snowbirds, the 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 Quebecois snowbirds, man. Whoo, whoo. 
The Isn't that just all tourists and you just happen to be over indexed? I mean, in, uh, it, 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 it would be, I would anybody be from somewhere. About other tourists, but I'm not. I'm prejudicing about one, one group. You know, I, it's funny. I was just talking to a friend last night about like, oh yeah, I'm from wine country. You know, I would say that as like a starting point where they, mm -hmm. you know, they might say like, where exactly? Or like, oh yeah, wine country. Got it. Um, but you know, obviously like big tourist destination, but mm -hmm. there's nobody that I can think of where I'd be like, mm, that, that certain group where they're, well, the you know, what's certain about because we're going to do the show. And okay. maybe you'll think of a group that you can say you're prejudiced against because who would ever be upset about you ever saying you're prejudiced against <laughs> no, any no, This is group? not, no, it's, yeah. it, this is Justin R. Young on Twitter. Very, it's a very chill topic. <laughs> All right, let's get going. Are you guys let's ready? Let's do it. Yeah. In three, two, Andrew Boudreaux has supported independent tech news directly for five years. Be like Monsieur Boudreaux. Become a DTNS member at patreon.com slash DTNF. This is the Daily Tech News for Thursday, April 4th, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. From the goose-laden shores of Lake Merritt, I'm Justin Robert Young. And I'm the show's producer who likes everyone, Roger Chan. <laughs> <laughs> he really does. <laughs> oh, bonjour! How, how nice Roger. for you, Roger. What's that like? Uh, goose laden shores. It's so poetic. <laughs> I feel like you're the Edgar Allan Poe of Lake Merritt. That's lovely. <laughs> uh, we are going to talk about uh, digital literacy, specifically a BuzzFeed article about how it applies to those over the age of sixty-five. But let's start with a few tech things you should know. Snapchat introduced Snap Game, a platform for users to play real-time multiplayer games supported by six-second unstoppable ads. Snap also launched an AR platform called Scan with partnerships with Photomath and Giphy. And App Stories will let developers insert Snapchat stories into their own apps with Tinder and House Party, two of the first to do so. Snapchat also unveiled a new slate of 10 original series. Kind of a trend. Mm, I wonder if that'll work. After re uh, a review of international projects and partnerships, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology has decided against, quote, accepting new engagements or renewing existing ones with Huawei or ZTE due to federal investigations regarding violations of sanctions uh, restrictions. MIT said it will revisit its collaborations with Huawei and ZTE over time. WhatsApp for business customers launched on iOS after previously being only available on Android. According to Facebook, which owns WhatsApp, WhatsApp business has been adopted by millions of businesses worldwide since its debut. The Australian Parliament passed the Sharing of Abhorrent Violent Material Law on Thursday, which creates new offenses for content service providers and hosting services that fail to notify the Australian Federal Police about or fail to swiftly remove videos depicting things like terrorist acts, murders, attempted murders. You get the idea. And 9to5 Google reports Google has sent music artists an email letting them know it's going to shut down Google Play Artist Hub. April 30th, artists will now need to publish their songs with a YouTube partner if they want to get into Google's music service. YouTube music is taking over for Google Play Music. So CD Baby, TuneCore, those kind of places uh, will allow you to publish your music into the ecosystem. Uh, and it's a signpost along the transition, the long transition of merging Google Play Music into YouTube music. All right, let's talk a little bit more about space internet, Justin. Space, space, space. Amazon made three sets of filings with the International Telecommunications Union last month by the Federal Communications Commission on behalf of Kuiper Systems LLC, which is based in Washington, D.C. Amazon's Project Kuiper plans to provide low latency broadband internet access using 3,236 satellites in low Earth orbit. Amazon confirmed to GeekWire that Kuiper is one of its projects saying it will target 56 degrees north to 56 degrees south latitude, which will cover 95% of the Earth's population. SpaceX, SoftBank-backed OneWeb, Telesat, and Facebook and Boeing-backed Leosat are also attempting to do the same thing. Yeah, so, I mean, not much to say here other than, okay, cool. 
we got we got another uh, company into the pool. And to note that Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, also running a company that launches things into space called Blue Origin. Uh, they actually GeekWire asked him about this, and and they said uh, we will evaluate evaluate Blue Origin as a carrier for our satellites, just like everybody else. Yeah, uh, I think we, we are at the point now where you have to just wonder, OK, well, who's going to be the first to set up a, 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 a sign up page and say you can start using our Internet right now? Yeah. Um, and for you, San Francisco Giants baseball fans, no word on a Project Kruko. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's funny when I hear stories like this, I'm like, okay, well, I mean, if anyone could do it, it's probably Amazon, but yeah. then there's also SpaceX and, you know, there, we, we talk about competitor stories doing things like this all the time. I, I feel like we're still in that mode where it's like, okay, here's another company who's going to bring internet to a lot of the world's population that doesn't really have good access right now. And it's a little bit more of a, uh, 3,000 satellites rather than a, this is how it's affecting people in the real world. Yeah, because we don't have a service yet. No, exactly. Totally. Yeah. Amazon announced six new skills for Amazon voice services from healthcare companies such as Cigna and Boston Children's Hospital, and they are HIPAA compliant. The skills can help schedule appointments, check recent blood sugar readings, check prescription delivery status, and deliver updates from caregivers as well. Developers who want to make their own healthcare skills must apply to an invite-only program to participate. The one question that I could not find an answer to, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, is how these are protected from being accessed by anyone else in your house. Uh, because the Amazon Echo very famously responds to anyone saying it's trigger word. Uh, and that means, I mean, I guess the idea is, well, if you're in your house, you know, potentially you you would either mute these things or turn them off if there's someone in your house that you didn't want to access them. But I feel like it needs a little more protection than that. Yeah, but what they're doing is not you know, necessarily revealing if you're checking on the shipment of your pills or something like that, that that isn't exactly revealing. I mean, I guess it can be. And, and there's a reason why these, you know, uh, healthcare information, right? Yeah. People get real protective about it. Sure. Uh, uh, I, I guess th th there is a larger question of exactly how HIPAA did certify these. And there uh, is a, like a there is, there are systems in the Echo, like the PIN when you order something from Amazon, where it yeah. says you know. So I'm I'm not saying they don't exist. I just couldn't find anything about that. But you're still saying it. I guess yeah. I mean, it would be something to say out loud. There's no way that you can interact with the Echo uh, uh, securely while there are other people around, right? That would because if you're just yelling your password out. But then again, I guess. <laughs> Then you don't care whether or not they yeah, hear obviously, the because right. they can hear the answer. I, I do think it's it's fair to point out that Amazon is uh, is, you know, this is something where they're trying to differentiate themselves from the other smart speakers out there by saying, look, look at what we have in healthcare, which is for, you know, for people who don't want to have to go digging into an app uh, to find out some some simple information like this is pretty convenient. Uh, uh, also makes sense considering they are moving more in a healthcare direction that they want more and more ways that you can interact with your, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your, your, your healthy life via Amazon products and services. Microsoft is making changes in how it will roll out its May update to Windows 10, uh, currently uh, codenamed 19H1. Rolls off uh, the tongue. It's the 1903 update uh, if, you're, if you're looking at the, the insider preview number. Uh, in order to avoid problems it had with its October update, here are some of the things that are changing. First, a release preview will come out next week with a month scheduled for testing. And hopefully we'll be able to find more bugs that way. Also, the choice between monthly updates out twice yearly feature updates will be made clearer and you will be able to choose whether you want monthly updates or twice yearly updates. And if you choose monthly updates, you can say just security. Don't give me the feature updates, at least for 18 months. So if you're like, I, you know what? I don't trust that that feature in the new, uh, in the new spring update is going to work yet. Hold off on that, but give me my monthly security updates. You can choose to do that. Users will also be able to delay monthly updates for a week for up to five weeks. If they're like, you know what? I want the monthly feature update, but give me two weeks, give me three weeks on that. You'll get to choose that. 
Microsoft will also adjust active hours. That's the time it determines it won't push an update, which you set right now. It's going to use some machine intelligence to be able to guess based on your usage when the best bet is to push an update out. And a new dashboard is going to make it easier to see what else you need to update in order to keep compatibility, things like drivers, et cetera. Microsoft will use machine learning also to help identify important bug reports. Uh, the bug that was deleting data in the October update had been reported. It just wasn't properly elevated. So they're going to use some machine intelligence to help look for that. And they're not just going to look in their insider program. They're going to take data from Twitter and Reddit to try to determine when people are saying things are happening, whether it's worth looking at or not. I mean, you explaining this right now makes perfect sense. But how is Microsoft going to make sure that it, you know, the average user is like, okay, I understand my 900 options for updates. Well, I, that's a fair point because these are for the people who are already complaining that they don't have this option. Yeah. The average user is just going to say, yeah, give me my updates when I'm not working. And the active hours is going to automatically do it when they're not working. And that's that. Right. But the yeah. people who are like, I don't want you pushing this update on me. Give me control. Well, now you have some. I mean, but that's what Windows does, Sarah. They give you nine thousand options. That's that's <laughs> the, the that's the point. They, they are they are a, a random. Justin, don't of exaggerate. It's nine hundred options. Nine hundred billion <laughs> options and counting uh, from the Windows operating system, and they should. This is no. For... It's, it's 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 if you care about these sorts of things, this is great. You know, when you when you kind of see it read out, you're like. Uh, it's talk about confusing folks, but yeah. again, you know, to Tom's point, this is this, these are options for people who want them um, for everybody else. It's like, sort of like, yeah, just like, don't restart my computer when I'm doing something. Yeah. You know, when I'm in the, when middle. I'm in the middle of something. Yeah. Like, but you know, doing my online banking. And, yeah. I, you know, I think that that is one aspect of this. The other aspect being, uh, the, the, the big problem with the October update was not only that there was a bug that was deleting your data, which is awful, but that, People had noticed it before this was released and they didn't find, you know, there's so many bug reports, it didn't get surfaced properly. So taking some extra steps to make sure that important bugs are noticed and surfaced properly, which I know it's easy in hindsight to go, it was a bad bug. Why didn't you surface it? But anybody who's managed a bug queue knows it's, it's a trick to figure out which of the bugs are actually the priority ones you need to, you need to work on because everybody thinks their bug is a P1. Well, here is a bug that we've thankfully been able to rectify the harm from. The Internet Archive published a catalog of 490,000 MySpace songs from between 2008 and 2010, originally thought to be lost after a server migration error. The saved tracks were apparently collected by an anonymous academic group that was studying music networks during MySpace's popularity. The group contacted the Internet Archive with the files. The music can be played through an online interface designed to look like MySpace's original music player. You know, what's funny about this is 490,000 songs. You're like, wow, OK. But that it, it was, what, 5 million overall that were lost. So it's it's a very small sample of the total songs that still have not been recovered but very interesting that an anonymous academic group was like, hey, Internet Archive, we can help. We can help here. 50, 50 million tracks. 50 well, million yeah. tracks. But yeah. everybody, don't frown because it's gone. Smile because it happened, which would mm. be a quote I'd see a lot on MySpace pages and something we should remember that any of this music was recovered because it could have all been lost. You know, this is... <sighs> I, I'm going to bang this drum once, okay? And I promise not to bang it again this episode. If we had looser copyright laws, this wouldn't have happened. This academic team has to be anonymous because they're worried about the copyright implications of having saved this music. And the reason that the Internet Archive didn't just go ahead and save it is there were risks to copying MySpace music because the music copyright was the riskiest thing to meddle with. And We've lost music. Now you could say, eh, it must not be that important if we lost it. Okay, fine. But uh, a, a more reasonable copyright law would have helped prevent this. Mm. I, I really want to know more about the anonymous academic group and their many terabytes of data that they collected <laughs> oh during, during, during MySpace's, you know, uh, heyday, because it, it was, it was obviously probably something that, uh, 
that had more to do with just like who's uploading music onto MySpace. But yeah, I think they were they were wanting to look into sharing and how how music yeah. spread and 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 legitimate academic investigations. Um, but they've always been worried about you know you know we're studying music networks on MySpace is what they what they say in the Verge article, but they're always worried about getting slammed for doing it. Don't get slammed. Get, I don't know. Bad get a Tesla. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get, get a, a Tesla. Tesla. Speaking of Tesla, Tom, weird, <laughs> weird. You almost read my mind. Tesla delivered 63,000 cars last quarter, which is down 31% from the previous quarter. Recodes at Renny Mola points out that while Tesla sells a lot fewer cars than, say, Toyota or Ford, Tesla's Model 3 was the best-selling luxury car last year, according to Car and Driver. The Model 3 sold 138,000 cars. Number two was the Lexus RX at 112,000 models. But Tesla likes to talk about the Model 3 as a mass market car. And Elon Musk has also predicted demand for 500,000 Model 3s in 2019. 500,000 would make it one of the best selling cars, period. Forget yeah. luxury. You can argue that there are better luxury appointments in a Lexus RX than in a Model 3. And Tesla really wants to build the Model 3 as an everyman car, which I find hilarious when it costs $35,000 and up to $60,000, depending on how you equip it. Uh, so I think it's yeah. fair to look at this as a luxury car. I don't think Tesla has made a an every person car yet. Well, yeah, th th this is them trying to do what Apple has done very successfully, which is saying uh, this is certainly a higher cost, but it's a bargain when you look at what you get. Uh, uh, sure, this is this is for the real coupon clippers because uh, uh, you're going to own this car forever and it's going to cost you less in the long run. And there's a lot of other uh, uh, bonus things to it that will just make your life easier. You're saving money spending this $60,000. You know, Joe Sixpack? <laughs> You I it, it, money it, to make money. And we we had we were kicking around the idea of like is Tesla the every person vehicle company before the show and I mean I say no. It's it's first of all the whole idea of the electric car is still we're still getting to the point where you could take a real road trip that it that lasts more than 300 miles and be able to do that without oh, charging sure. it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And also being able to charge your car and the fact that it is expensive there. I mean, this is not an economy vehicle, even the model three. You sure. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's Tesla is, is working towards making it more accessible for, for most people, but it's still very much out of reach for most people who are looking for not, not all electric vehicles are this expensive. I mean, no. electric vehicles. Well, in that's general and that's are, my point. Well, yeah, it's Tesla. That's it. That's yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean, this is you know, it's, it's they're very cool cars. I'm I'm a sure. Tesla fan, but 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 this is not like a economy budget no, option. No, no. And 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 really, it's like th their supply chain hasn't even allowed for the fact that they you know could could sell at the at the level that they want to they hope that they are able to continue to ramp that up running a car company is really hard and and i think it is to tesla's credit that they understood exploiting the upper end of car buyers uh, uh first and then slowly making your way down was the way to do it because unless you are already in the game it's very very hard there's a reason why we hadn't had a new american car company in decades uh, uh until tesla came along because it's a perilous, perilous uh, field to get into. We, we barely have any new car companies at all. Yeah, in the world. where where we have them are in emerging markets. You know, the places like China and now India are starting to see newer car companies. But that's because they there's room in those markets to move in on the low price. You don't you don't see new car companies in Europe even. Yeah, uh, it's a really good point. And uh, yeah, I think you know. Bottom line. I know that Tesla has to talk about the Model 3 as being accessible to get people interested in it, but a lot of people criticize Tesla for not selling at levels that I don't think they're meant to sell at. No. Hey folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right. BuzzFeed has a story out called Old Online and Fed on Lies. How an aging population will reshape the internet. 
Uh, we're going to try not to critique the article itself or its headline. It opens. With <laughs> there are people trying to bridge the digital divide, particularly with retirees. Uh, people over the age of 65 definitely do need a little more help get, getting into digital stuff if they aren't already there. There are plenty of people over the age of 65 who know how to use stuff. Uh, but there are some people who over the age of 65, probably more often than in the you know teens and 20s age group, that might need somebody to like, hey, show me how this works. And there are groups trying to do that. And I think that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. Some of the points from the article, though, are trying to paint a picture of the growth of the 65 plus age group, which will soon be the U.S. largest age group, uh, as problematic because of a lack of digital literacy. Uh, for instance, multiple studies are cited arguing that older people are not as good at spotting accurate news and more likely to spread fake news. Research published in Science Advances in January, peer-reviewed article found that users over the age of 65 on Facebook shared nearly seven times as many articles from fake news domains as the youngest age group. Now, we'll, we'll go on with a couple of other things here, and I want to circle back to that in a second. Loneliness can affect your cognitive function, and older people are often, just by circumstance, more lonely. Physical and mental health can be affected by that. It can result in a decline in the ability to self-regulate, which could cause people to gravitate towards like-minded views because they want to feel included. Again, not all people over the age of 65, but it is more prevalent in that age group. Older people are generally more likely to be victims of fraud as our critical abilities decline with age. The older you get, the less critical abilities you have. That's just a fact of getting older. And we all try to correct for that in various ways. So in sum, as always, as we all age, we have a harder time keeping up with new things and the internet, it appears, is not an exception. Also, people who are new to the internet have a harder time getting used to it than people who've had it for a while or for all their life. I think that one's age independent, uh, whether you're over the age of 65 or not. So is there actually a new problem here? I'm not saying there shouldn't be groups going out and saying, hey, folks over the age of 65, let's help you get up to speed on how this internet stuff works if you don't know already, which some of you do. Uh, and is there a risk to this, Justin? Are, are, are the people who are over the age of 65 who tend to vote in larger numbers being swayed by all this fake news? No! I mean, uh, all right. Are, are they being uh, swayed by the fake news? Maybe. Uh, uh, they certainly share it at a disproportionately larger number. Uh, but I don't know if that should be a shocking thing considering... Facebook is a platform designed to maximize your time on that platform. Retirees have a lot of time, and there are many soci uh, you know, uh, societal things that contribute to that. There certainly is a, a case to be made that that uh, loneliness that sets in in some of our elder uh, uh, elders is something that we should think about and look at and possibly correct for, and this might be a panacea for, for that. But I do not believe in any way, and I'm going to refrain from, from singling this article out specifically because I made a promise to Tom. But uh, I will say the general idea that elders are in some way polluting or ruining the internet because they are sharing things that make it worse is wrong and I would say offensive to uh, many uh, folks who just enjoy having something to do. Well, like us all. yeah, I mean, I think there's a couple things when you think of a, 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 the aging population. OK, if you're retired and you've got more time on your hands than somebody who has to work, I don't know, a minimum of eight hours a day on other things. Yeah, you might end up spending more time on a social network. And that actually factors into how that social network might want to act because you're actually on the social network more than uh, other folks. Also, I, you know, and I, I, you know, I think of my own mom as, as an example of this, but like somebody who never had to use the internet as part of her job as a younger person, you know, you're retired, you've got some time in your hands. You might use a social network, like purely in a social aspect, the way that Justin and Roger and Tom mm -hmm. and I don't, because we've never really known it other uh, as as anything other than like a tool, which is also social. And I think that that's an important distinction. And yeah. I, I, I also think that part of it is there is a different way that 
uh, folks who, uh, you know, they were fairly late in life when social networks came along, think about social networks. We think about it far more as a busy, bustling town square where I think many folks who are on there, they see a meme and it might be mean and it might be pointed, it might be politically charged, but they look at it like they would a bumper sticker, except they don't actually have to drive around with it. So they share it and some friends talk about it and, and other friends don't. And maybe they get the goat of, you know, the their, their, their niece who is, uh, you know, getting a, a liberal arts degree and, and they can go to sleep. Like, I, I just think it's harmless. It is harmless. Uh, I had a great interview with uh, uh, Professor Joseph Yuzinski from the University of Miami. He has written a book called American Conspiracy Theories all about political conspiracy theories and how they have propagated throughout the years. He did an empirical study of looking at letters to the editor from the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times over a hundred year span and compared it to where we are now and also compared it to data of what people believe, or at least in terms of surveys. Conspiracy theories have gotten shorter in their lifespans since the internet. As much as we like to figure out uh, we like to, to to look at things and like, oh, well, look, a bunch of people believe something because this guy said it or this per this thing has gone viral on Facebook. Fake news is ruining the world by the numbers. The shelf life on a conspiracy theory is diminishing because we have a, 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 a world, a galaxy of fact checkers to knock things down faster than we did before. So I, I, I just I, I think that there is a criticism to say, well, Maybe the platform time spent on platform at all costs mentality that we've had with social networks does on some level target uh, older Americans. And we should think about that. But blaming them. ugh. yeah, I, I there's two things I would take out of this article uh, that I think are worthwhile. One is what I said before, that uh, people who are new to the Internet, no matter what their age, have a harder time getting used to it and understanding how it works. Uh, there may be a percentage wise, larger number of people in the 65 plus age group that are new to the internet just because it wasn't around for most of their life. But I don't think there's really a problem with 65 plus. And that is a problem with this article that, that Justin rightly points out. Uh, but whether you're 65 plus or 65 negative, uh, you, if you are unfamiliar with the internet, there, that is something we need to do. We need to help people improve their digital literacy and understand how the internet works, how to avoid scams, how to understand when someone is saying something, where it reaches, when what you say, uh, where it goes, and how to protect yourself online. That is important for all age groups. Also, it is absolutely true that as we get older, uh, we are all getting worse at critical thinking. And when you're in your 20s, uh, you tend to discount that because you're really good at it. Uh, but it's been proven over decades that you're more likely to fall for a scam the older you are. And that's not new on the internet. Maybe it's a little more accelerated. Maybe it's not. Uh, it's not a new problem. Most of these problems that are 65 plus aren't new problems. It's just the internet puts them in a new way of looking at them, which is not new itself. When there was television and newspapers, that was that brought new problems. Every new technology brings new problems. So I'm not trying to deny that there are problems, but the fact that there are problems isn't new. It's not like, oh, everything was fine for everybody 65 plus until that internet came along and made them all believe a bunch of lies. I just, I don't buy that at all. And I think it's an unproductive way of looking at things. Uh, I, I will say shout out to the AARP who in this uh, article, they do begin and end the article talking about a program that uh, uh, shows elder Americans uh, how to use iPads and communicate with their family. I think that's a great, great, great uh, program. So uh, if you know somebody that would be that would be appropriate for, then it's great that it, uh, great that it exists. Speaking of great programs, we have a subreddit. And thanks to everybody who participates in it. You can submit stories and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. You want to hang out on Facebook? Well, we've got a group, facebook.com slash groups slash dailytechnewsshow. Let's check out the mailbag. Let's do it. This one comes from Brandon. Brandon, we're going in the other direction. Uh, Brandon has a daughter. Uh, he's uh, She's about to turn 10. Brandon says, it's got me and my wife talking about smart devices for her. My wife is hesitant to give her a smartphone as by the time we lock it down, it would be a little better than a feature phone. Plus, being a kid, she could lose it. We were thinking about a smartwatch with 
cellular connectivity so she could reach us should she need to. I was wondering what the other parents are doing or thoughts about kids and smartphones in general. Roger, you've got two kids and I, I know you're still trying to figure this out yourself. It's it's tough because it's uh, one of those things that is ubiquitous in life. Like you just can't even go out in public and not see someone, even a young person, use a, a smartphone or a tablet. And uh, we've tried to lock down the devices that we give them as much as possible. But, you know, occasionally we'll give them our phone uh, to play with uh, YouTube kids. Uh, as, you know, I'm hoping that in the next, in the 10 year or the, the next seven years, um, there will be a device that will be more age appropriate. So instead of taking a device that was designed for adults and then just kind of taking and stripping away the features to make it more dumbed down have something that's more uh, kind of in tune with, the, a, a, you know, an adolescent lifestyle. So maybe like a smart bracelet or something. Mm. Uh, but as for phones, I would give them, I would give her, my eldest daughter a phone when if she could use it solely for communication but just with me uh but like very very uh, a very limited set which i don't think would be a bad thing she'd probably be laughed at at school but i, I could live with it well <laughs> folks if you uh have uh, other answers or, or opinions or thoughts on that yeah send them our way parents feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com yeah, and thanks, Brandon, for for writing in this question and, and starting the conversation. Also, thanks to Justin Robert Young for being with us today, Mr. Politics. What's new in your world? Got a great interview up uh, uh, this week with, uh, as I mentioned, Dr. or sorry, Professor Joseph Uzinski of the University of Miami. Uh, I thought it was uh, uh, great. He was fantastic, uh, breaking down not only where conspiracy theories come from, popular ones, ones that uh, existed in the past, why they propagate, and how we can think about them as critically as we can. I would can encourage you to go download that Conspiracy Theories Are For Losers, an interview with Professor Joseph Uzinski uh, on the Politics, Politics, Politics feed. Yeah, I like how he starts off uh, differentiating conspiracies, which are real, yes. from conspiracy theories, which may or may not be real. Yeah, uh, folks, our goal each month is to get one more patron than last month. And you could be the person that puts us over the top if you're not already there. And if you're already there, share the news about becoming a DTNS member. It's Thursday. That means Roger's got a column out uh, Saturday. I'm going to have an editor's desk out. There's all kinds of cool stuff you get uh, in your RSS feed from Patreon, including the fact that it doesn't have any ads. Uh, all of that and more available. Go check it out at patreon.com slash DTNS. If you've got feedback, our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. It's a great way to keep in touch with us. We're also live Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow to talk about blockchain and cryptocurrency with Laura Shin, maybe Len Peralta. We'll talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Great show. What should we call hmm. it? Not late for dinner. Oh, snap. Oh, snap. Okay. What do we got here? My uh, soft may roll out its update differently. In my day, news wasn't fake. Hashtag Dewey defeats Truman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, BioCal aimed that one at me. You know that. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tesla, the apple of cars. Uh, older dogs learn new online tricks. In space, nobody can hear you ping. <laughs> Um, um, don't get slammed. Get a Tesla. Beaming from I guess the same to you too, Jerry. So, oh, I, I like this one. Uh, 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 the, the the Amazon Echo trigger word. Uh, did Dad take his meds? <laughs> <laughs> Alex. I like that they call him Alex. Alex. For the headline. Alex. Did Dad take Alex. his meds? I'm sorry. I can't help you with that. Uh, yeah. I do like a uh, uh, Fred uh, uh, pointing out one of the, uh, the, the 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 tropes of this show. Demographic goes here is not a monolith. <laughs> I, that's pretty good. We're gonna bring you details and context, friends, so you can live a better life. 
Uh, improving digital literacy is actually a nice digital button, literacy. A descriptive one. I don't know. What do y'all like? Anything? Catch um, even though we mentioned it not at all in the show, uh, I, I, I do want to name it RIP Inbox. Because it's oh, uh, you're I, you're really sad about the inbox. Yeah, we mentioned that in our Google Plus goodbye. Earlier. It didn't. I literally held on until the wheels fell off this morning, and it just would not let me load my app. And now kicks all inbox traffic to Gmail. Yeah. What was the Launch, thing they you liked the best boy. about inbox that Gmail? I, li literally, there wasn't necessarily any kind of features that I used. I just, you know, uh, we are creatures of habit. Yeah. I like. I switched yeah, yeah. to it. I used no, I, it. I gave mm -hmm. it my faith, and it broke my heart. Google again, again with these. Uh, you know, reader, part of my life. God, oh, reader. I so miss reader. I don't. Mm. I was really upset when they got rid of it, and Feedly has been great, and I don't miss reader a bit. I miss it. <laughs> I'm I have no emotional though. ties to old software. Robot, you're a robot. I have no feelings. Emotions are for the weak. Improving digital literacy. Yeah? yeah Why I'd not? Let's do it. Give it All a go. Right. Uh, what, would no be a cool, what would be a cool uh, follow-up if you, that wasn't available? Oh, I see what you're after. Yeah. Do you? <laughs> yeah. Tom bangs his drum but once. <laughs> I will bang my drum but once. I will only bang he my drum. He to bang on his drum all day. Uh, that one. Gone. Okay, done. Tom bangs his drum, but once. Oh, it so, doesn't say but once. It just says bangs just, his drum. I just do bang his drum. Justin. Justin. Yeah. Do you want to say what you really felt? Oh, about the BuzzFeed article? Yeah, yeah. So there's a thing that happens in trend uh, uh, pieces and trend journalism where <clears throat> if you don't have actual proof that what you are talking about exists you can just kind of frankenstein a bunch of stuff together and just sort of leave it hanging yep. and that's effectively what this does uh it's not lazy in the case that they didn't go out and talk to enough people like a, a lazy trend piece will normally be like uh side ponytails are all the rage amongst <laughs> women and and then they interview three people with side ponytails and they act like it's like okay. Yeah, you have no idea whether or not uh, it's it's anything beyond the writer's uh, friends, right? Uh, this is just I, I feel like it wants to go in a lot of places, and instead of taking a more sober look, it it uh, decided to go. And if I'm going to really read between the lines, uh, I think that it's a uh, it's a, a it, it, it reads to me like an editor got it and said, yeah, but what about the fake news thing? And then stapled on, mm. like, go talk to a political mm -hmm. uh, a person to talk about the damaging elements of fake news on, on an election. And it's like, I just, I, I don't think that the evidence lies there. I don't think that we have seen uh, uh, the, the case of it, nor do I necessarily think that the conclusions that are drawn which is like, oh, well, look at how, you know, a, a very hyper partisan group like Turning Point, which posts memes all day long about, uh, uh, you know, disparaging liberals and liberal causes and, and you know, making, uh, you know, extolling the virtues of conservative ones that is theoretically there for kids, for like college age conservatives. It's kind of like a bratty young Republican kind of uh, kind of thing is disproportionately shared by boomers. Boomers love Turning Point more than the 18 year olds do. But really, what's the harm? Like, what are we really losing by your your grandpa or your uncle or your grandma or your your aunt posting about, you know, a, a dumb Photoshop about uh, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez next to a farting cow. Like there, it's, there's, well, it's 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 all about, and this this is what bugs me about this story myself. It's all about emotions. These yeah. things make me angry when I see them. Yes, and I I really do think that undermines a lot of the out culture of outrage we have. Is we just didn't used to see the stuff that made us mad very mm -hmm. often. We did weren't exposed to as many different viewpoints. And so we're going through a period where everyone's looking around and going, oh my gosh, everyone around me is, is, is insane because they're saying all these things when it's not everyone. 
It's no. just way more people. It's a representation bias. It's way more people than you're used to seeing. So there, therefore you assume there's more of them where that came from. Uh, and, and so this, this article makes a lot of assumptions about what's wrong and then tries to find examples of them. Yes. And, and to me, the biggest thing is why is, you know, why are we demonizing these elders when it's the platform that like if it, it, it boils down to this, all the old people are going to get on these networks and they're going to twist the algorithm. So all we see are whatever the crazy things that they're being targeted with. Right. And it it is so backwards to me that we would have that conversation and blame the elders and not the algorithm. Well, and, and that's the thing, right? Is sometimes when I start down this road, I get people who will say to me, oh, so there's no problem at all, huh? You know, you're just being blind. I'm like, no, I'm not trying to say there isn't a problem. Problem. Obviously, we are living in different times. Yeah. Things are happening that we would not have expected to happen in multiple ways. But just starting to throw stones and point fingers won't help us understand why. And and also, I I don't believe that there's much of a difference in like I don't think that people are being radicalized that you know like all of a sudden my my uh you know the the, the older folks in my life uh are, are going to have radically different political views they they're probably going to have political views that naturally list one way or another and probably would have without Facebook but now they just got memes that they can share and there is an effect that the media has on voting. Otherwise, you wouldn't see candidates appearing in the media and buying commercials, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so the rise of technology and social networks definitely is changing how that works. And I always like to point out that uh, depending on where you sit, Facebook was horrible in the 2016 or the 2012 election because people taking advantage of the way it worked we're able to gain an advantage in the election. Yeah. And it happened in both elections. So it's it's not necessarily that there's a problem. It's that we have a new tool and we need to understand how it affects things so that we can try to correct for any abuses of it. Yeah. Anyway, it just it, it's one of them articles that I got. I got stuck in my craw and I wasn't a fan of it. And I I, I I wanted to stick up for stick up for the old folks. <laughs> Cause you know what? A lot of them are in our audience and are real good with technology. Oh yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, I'll tell you, all the French Canadian ones are sure going to be uh, good at emailing me. <laughs> Hitting my hat replies. There ain't no yeah. aid group on a hate email. I'll tell you what. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Um, oh, the, the one thing I, I, I thought I would end up talking about that because of the nature of the article, I didn't, uh, was disabusing people of that idea that because you're old, you can't handle technology. I mean, we, we sort of tangentially touched on it, but uh, it it's not that, that people can't do it at all. No, my, my grandfather, uh, literally up until the day that he died was a computer enthusiast. And granted he, uh, you know, he worked at Sperry gyroscope, uh, in his, in his younger days, he was more technologically inclined, but he was the first per person to introduce me to, to technology. Uh, he, you know, owned an Apple two GS, uh, and that's how I learned how to type, uh, uh, initially. And, hmm. um, you know, I remember, uh, he was on like instant messenger like uh, uh, uh as i was as like a, a young kid in fact that was one of the creepiest things that ever happened was after he passed i was on instant messenger one day and uh, uh i guess somebody had turned on his computer oh, and, yeah. and his his username logged in and i was like ah yeah <laughs> like, the default set tech said so and so just logged in you're like exactly oh. yeah uh so uh, i've always understood in my life at least by my own anecdotal experiences that uh some people are into tech and some people aren't. It doesn't matter what age you are. Now, tech has become more prevalent in our world. Uh, it is easier now to do than it ever has been. And that's where I think you're getting a lot of people that might not have done it if the cost barrier was higher or the mm. learning curve were more steep. But that's just 
the, the world we live in. And, well, and, and I think, you know, I think the way that we say like, well, you're just from an older generation, things were different then. It's exactly the same. The technology being part of something that somebody grew up with is reality for many younger people. But it's also just like, a, you know, an older person maybe being like, whatever that slang is going on. I don't really get it. Explain yeah. that to me. It's we've been doing this for centuries. And it takes you longer to learn things. The older you get, it yeah. just, it's just true. And so at some point you're going to say like, you know what, just do it for me. It's like, it's just yeah. going to be, it's just going to take forever. I like, do that now. Yeah. I exactly. just like, and you'll do I don't it care. More the older you get. Um, it's funny, so Justin, when you uh, mentioned your great uncle, I think it was, or your uncle, my grandma, my dad's mom was on instant messenger and she would, she'd log on and, you know, she'd oh, chat yeah. with me fairly regularly, but she called it going onto the internet. And yeah. to her, that was it. Yes. The, it, the internet was, is Sarah online? I can talk to her in real time. Like that was what the internet was to her. She didn't care about anything else. And it was kind of funny to me, but I was like, you're not really wrong. This is just what you care about, you yeah. know, as an 85 year old woman. And I think there is an important point to be made that is not age related, which is why I didn't touch on it in the show today about accessibility. Yes. Uh, as, as technology is getting more prevalent, we're putting more and more services online, which means those people who don't have access to technology. And I don't just mean accessibility as in, you know, visual impairment or, or, or deafness or anything like that. Although that's part of it. I just mean like somebody who's like, yeah, I can't afford even a, a really good smartphone, uh, with an internet connection, like that still happens. And so you need to take a, take that into account when rolling out services more and more. I mean, we think it's great. Like, Hey, I can pay my water bill online. That's awesome. I love that. Uh, but, but there is always going to be hopefully a shrinking number of people who can't take advantage of that. And you don't want those services to not be available for those people uh, just because they're not yet in the position that they can take advantage of them. Yeah. <sighs> well, uh, we've now solved all the world's problems video. All folks. the world's problems. So, uh, thank you for watching audio folks stick around because there's more to come because maybe we didn't solve quite all of them.